Assalamu alaikum students. Uh, this is a send up SEQ key discussion video, uh, which was held for second year MBBS. Uh, the first question that was given was this. Uh, let me switch to the lines here. So uh, it mentions a doctor of your uncle has prescribed him a loop diuretic for blood pressure issues. And then the questions are two. One is uh, the question asked about the renal segment that this drugs that this drug acts on. Remember, we're talking about a loop diuretic uh, and which uh, transporter does it block? And the second question is, uh, again, the key is one and one. One and one means that you need to give the segment that, that will get you one mark. And when you mention the transporter, it will get you the second mark. Okay. Second question was this drug has an undesirable side effect related to potassium. It was um, it's a pretty straightforward thing. I, I was hoping uh, what is it and how can it be avoided? Okay. Now the key is the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is that segment and sodium two chloride potassium poor transporter is the transporter, which loop diuretics uh, basically block. The side effect is hypokalemia. And how does hypokalemia happen? You know this, uh, if you lose a lot of potassium because you have blocked this particular transporter, so the potassium in the lumen will be lost in the urine. Uh, the excretion of potassium will be increased and hence in the, in the ECF, there will be less potassium called hypokalemia. And for this, uh, to prevent this, uh, what can be used is a are potassium sparing diuretics, uh, for example, spironolactones, um, uh, unlike, it should be unlike, this should not be there, it should be unlike. So uh, we use potassium sparing diuret diuretics, unlike furosemide. Okay. The second question was almost like an MCQ. Uh, it mentions that uh, there's a woman who has been vomiting. This is a key point. Uh, was taken to the emergency department and the blood values. Now, whenever you get a acid base linked uh, question, remember to do the workout, the algorithm that I discuss in my lectures, that first you need to check pH, then you need to check bicarbonate, and then you check the blood gases. So in, in this case, the pH is obviously above 7.4, it's 7.5. So you know that it is an alkalosis. Now, which kind of alkalosis is, is it? The bicarbonate is 24 mmH um, milliequivalents per liter. In, normally, here it is 37. So obviously, it is the metabolic kind. And uh, PCO2 normally is around 40. This is 48. So obviously, carbon dioxide is being is being retained uh, so that it compensates for the alkalosis that is happening. So it is uh, a person is having metabolic alkalosis with respiratory compensation. Okay, so third question was about metabolic syndrome associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Again, a straightforward question. Metabolic uh, syndrome, uh, you should know, accompanies uh, this type of diabetes. It's uh, quite an issue, uh, uh, especially in also developing in your, your age group as well. The adolescents and the young, young people, uh, they are getting more uh, obese. And hence, they fall into this metabolic syndrome category and develop eventually diabetes. Insulin resistance is the key factor here, and you should know this. And these are the features, which again is taken from Guyton, uh, obesity, insulin resistance, fasting hypoglycemia, lipid abnormalities, and hypertension. This is what we were looking for uh, to describe the metabolic syndrome. Next up, question number four. We look at a 30 year old lady comes with a history of headache, profuse sweating, amenorrhea, joint pains. And this is the, the main feature here associated with changes in size of hands and feet. She also complains of sudden weakness when carrying, uh, carrying something uh, uh, upstairs. Going upstairs is also an issue. Physical examination gives you the main point here, marked enlargement of facial features as well as tongue, feet, and hands, okay? Thyroid enlargement is there as well. An ultrasound study shows fatty liver. Lab, lab, labs reveal high 
blood glucose level. Okay. We asked you the diagnosis, the cause for fatty liver, and the effect of this hormone, whichever it may be, on carbohydrate and fat metabolism. It's a straightforward endocrinology stock question. Uh, the key is long, that's why it's on, the, on another slide. And it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, recall based, so there's not, nothing much to explain. Diagnosis obviously is acromegaly, growth from excess um, is mobilizes fats, uh, increases uh, LDL receptors in the liver. That is what causes fatty liver. Okay, so that's answer to the B. Uh, C is effect of growth hormone on carbohydrates and on fat. This is pretty straightforward thing. Let me just uh, quickly go through it. In, on carbohydrates, it increases glucose uptake in tissues, increases in insulin resistance, decreases uptake of glucose by liver, and so on. And fat, you can see release of fats from adipose tissue, uses fats for energy in preference to carbohydrates and proteins, increases lean body mass, and causes a ketogenic effect, which is a hallmark of growth hormone. Question five was from CNS, uh, the motor division. Uh, we spoke, we asked you a patient was brought into the emergency roadside accident. MRI shows injury to the right side of the spinal cord L2. Uh, the questions were what will happen to the patient's fine touch and pain sensations on both sides of the lesion, i.e. the side of the lesion uh, and the opposite side of the lesion. Because we mentioned right side here, so we are interested to know if you know uh, what is the sensory loss on the right side, the same size, side, and on the opposite side, i.e. the left side, okay? And number two was pretty stock in the sense that draw and label TCMLS, okay? This was the question, and this is the key. Uh, the key is, again, straightforward. brown sicker syndrome is the diagnosis. Effects below the lesion, remember it's below. so. It's divided into same side and opposite side. Uh, you were asked only two. Uh, this question can come in different ways. Uh, another variant of this question is they can ask you, uh, describe all the sensations that are lost on the same side or on the opposite side, but we committed to two sensations, uh, which is fine touch and pain. So as you know, on the same side, fine touch uh, is lost because the DCMLS does not decussate at the level of entry, it decussates at the level of medulla. So fine touch is lost on the same side. Pain, however, crosses over. So pain is not lost from this side. However, on the opposite side, it's the mirror of what this is discussed here. Fine touch is not lost because again, yeah, the lesion is not here. Pain, however, is lost on this side. Okay, uh, this I have mentioned. Uh, uh, these are called schematic diagrams, okay? Um, and the reason to give you here both systems, what we asked was the DCMLS. However, uh, what you also can study from here is how to make the DCMLS pathway as well. These are this is a schematic way of drawing. Do not waste your time in an exam uh, going for uh, 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 detailed graphics or detailed structure. This is not an anatomy exam anyway. Uh, we are only interested in if you know uh, uh, where does it enter? What happens to the first uh, order, second, and third order neurons? Where do they where do they decussate? Again, these are important points here. Where do they decussate, and where do they terminate, and where do they end up? So, schematic diagrams are the way to go in such questions. Okay, this is a pet question of mine. Differentiate between decortication and decelebration. Uh, this is from the motor segment, and this is for vestibular operators differentiate between utricle and sac Um I have a, a, a mixture of responses uh, on this and uh, not really satisfied. Uh, I think we, we studied this in detail. Anyhow, this is, uh, uh, this is, the, this is the key for the cerebration decortication. I intend to do a, a, a focus video on this difference and some other topics uh, that I've also asked you. I'll also add some more topics from my own side. I'll do short videos for CNS, uh, which I think would be uh, good for you guys. Anyhow, um, so uh, 
D, what is decerebration? Decerebration, as you know, is a complete transaction of brainstem. This is where it happens between the superior and inferior colliculus, uh, and this is where the uh, the the uh, all the all the descending tracts, motor tracts, are passing through this area. When you cut this, uh, the brainstem pathways they become independent from any higher input, uh, and hence it's also called mid colliculus decerebration. Uh, what hap what it does is uh, it interrupts all the input from the corticospinal and rupturospinal tract. So these both tracts are lost uh, 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 their input to 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 the flex de uh, distal flexors are lost. Okay, and so this is the loss. Okay, um, as a consequence, excitatory and inhibitory reticulospinal, i.e., whatever stuff is below the lesion from the brain stem, whatever is is getting uh, down to the spinal cord that become that remains intact and in fact it becomes exaggerated in its response hence you have all sorts of rigidity in extension um, excitatory reticular spinal tract becomes overridden which leads to hyperactivity as i just mentioned in extensors in all four extremities it's called decerebrate rigidity i.e extensor rigidity in all four limbs so this is a snapshot of decerebration uh, uh, it 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 different it's different from decortication in a in a bit uh, in the sense that the lesion is above the lesion that is described here. Let me just show you. Uh, this is the level of lesion of decerebration. However, in decortication, uh, it is above that. So basically, the cerebral cortex, which is like an umbrella, uh, the lesion is just under it and uh, it cuts all the cerebral cortex fibers, which are going down to the midbrain and lower uh, and, and brainstem and so on they are cut. So you can say that you have removed the cerebral cortex in this situation, okay? Uh, the difference, uh, you can read this in your own time, the difference is quite clear and I've showed it in my lectures. This is the difference, okay? Now this is decortical, decorticate rigidity and this is decerebrate rigidity. You can see that in the lower limbs, it's, it's pretty much the same. However, this is where the, the difference is. Why do we have decorticate uh, in, in, why do we have flexion at the elbow in decorticate uh, posturing and not in decerebrate posturing? I'm not gonna give you the answer, but I would expect, uh, well, I would expect everyone to comment, but obviously some of uh, you only comment. So let's see if you get this right. What is the difference between this posture? What is the reason uh, behind the, these two differences? The rest is the same almost. Uh, utricle and saccule. Okay, so in the utricle and saccule, I've just picked uh, from uh, my own lecture, uh, which I sent to you, uh, based, uh, which is a summary of the functions of utricle and saccule. There are four functions and uh, I expect that uh, all of you, if you get a question, and this is a common question in the university exam, I don't expect only these lines that should be written. Uh, you should give some of, of some of details, some details with each headline. You can say this is a headline. So detection of change in head position. So detection of change in head position with respect to gravity, i.e. steady state, steady gravitational field uh, detection of head position is the overall function of autolith organs. Okay, these are both auto, autolith organs. Okay, as opposed to semicircular canals, they, they deal with uh, rotation. Okay. 3D rotation. Number two is detection of linear acceleration. Okay. So utricle responds to horizontal and saccule responds to vertical. This is the main difference. Um, right. So this is, uh, uh, this is based in, hold on, let me change the, the thing here. This is steady state, i.e. at rest. So at rest also, uh, the, the CNS is the price of the position. And this is while in motion, okay? Now, third is impulses from vestibular operators form an important component. So labyrinth writing reflexes, which I uh, intend to discuss in a short video separately, inshallah, uh, they also, utricular cycle also uh, uh, contribute to these reflexes. This is part of their function as well. Uh, and lastly, macula, they discharge tonically in the absence of any head movement uh, because autolith organs uh, are, uh, since they have statoconia on top of them, 
which is literally crystals embedded in a gelatinous material, they respond to gravity much more. So the gravitational pull is on them, and there's, hence there's a baseline discharge. Okay. So this is the function, summary of function of uteric and psyche. Most of the examiners, to be honest, are looking for this particular. So if you get a question in Viva, the first thing that you should mention is, oops, sorry, hold on, is this, this. They are looking for, if you know what utricle exactly does and sacule exactly does, and this is what they do. So write it first, and then you can write the other advanced stuff. Okay, the second last question was typical from special senses. Uh, it's a very famous uh, UQ impedance matching and place principle. Uh, this is given uh, very clearly uh, in Guyton. I'll just give you the headlines. You, you have to give a short, uh, you were supposed to give a short uh, paragraph on this, on this main thought. And what is that thought? Uh, impedance matching is basically tympanic membrane and ossicular system provide impedance matching between the sound waves and air and sound vibrations in the fluid. So the fluid in the cochlea, it is thick. Okay, it has a, it has a, it has a, it has obviously more specific gravity than air. But the point is, if you don't move, if you are unable to move it, the, there, there won't be any hearing, even though the sound is hitting. Okay, so the whole challenge is to somehow um, match the intensity of the sounds, sound waves to the movement of this fluid. So all that malleus, incus, and uh, stapes, all their movement is, is matched so that uh, there is congruence, there is uh, pro some proportion between the sound waves and the movement of the fluid inside the cochlea. And this is basically called impedance matching, okay? So this is one, read it from guidance, very clearly written there. Place principle, again, I'll just give you the main point here. This is the main point. Uh, you can read the, 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 the rest. Uh, it is the way by which nervous system detects different sound frequencies. So one is sound frequencies, okay? Uh, along which part of the basilar membrane uh, that they stimulate. So it's about which sound frequency is at the base of the basilar membrane, which part of it is uh, stimulated. This is called base, uh, place principle. Okay, the last question was mechanism for light and dark adaptation and its uh, significance. Okay, again, a straightforward question. Uh, this is the key for light adaptation and this is for dark adaptation and they are opposites of each other. Let me just explain this first. Uh, if somebody uh, remains in light for, for hours, bright light for hours, what happens is the last a large portion of the photochemicals, i.e. in the rods and cones, they reduce to retinal and opsins. And much of the retinal of both rods and cones are converted to vitamin A, okay? Overall, the sensitivity of the eye to light is correspondingly reduced because the person is in bright light. This is called light adaptation. Opposite is when somebody is in, let me change the color, in uh, darkness for a while, okay? Uh, what The opposite happens basically. Uh, retinal and opsins in the rods and cones are converted back to light sensitive pigments. So they increase. Vitamin A is converted back uh, into retinal. So, really opposite of what's happening. Uh, so, th so that you have more sensitive uh, pigment to make out what is in the dark. Okay. So, you, you realize that when uh, you are excessively in the dark, uh, for a, after a while, you can make out uh, shapes and uh, uh, gross features of whatever items are in there in the darkness. Uh, some of the mechanism of mechanisms of light and dark adaptation are change in uh, pupillary size, neural adaptation. Um, last point is significance. It obviously allows the eye to change its sensitivity according to the light uh, in uh, the person finds in or its herself in. Okay, so overall, um, a, a pattern has now emerged both in first and second years is that SEQ attempt is definitely weak, weaker than other segment. Uh, some kids uh, uh, have actually flunked the send up based on their SEQ attempt. And this is not cool at all. Hence the whole point here of discussing 
the key with you guys so that you know what we expect from you, okay? Please make a note of this and uh, try to improve these things, inshallah. The next time is the prof time, so you have time now. Um, so get cracking, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.